It's my pleasure this evening to welcome you to the Nebraska History Museum. And our second in our series of lectures is part of our special program, We the People, the Nebraska Viewpoint, subtitled Civil Rights and Civil Liberties, Understanding the Past, Looking to the Future. This is a year-long project. We're just getting started. As I said, this is our second lecture. There are a series of lectures, brown bags, which happen here at noon. Uh, also, a couple of uh, scheduled um, community conversations, which we hope some of you will come back for and help us explore uh, in a free, kind of a free discussion approach, uh, these concepts of uh, constitutionalism, uh, law, liberty, uh, who is included in the American we, if you will. And uh, we look forward to that. A couple other th parts of the project, one just came off the press today, and this is our uh, fall winter 2010 issue of Nebraska History. And it's a double issue, and it addresses the issue of um, and the um, exciting story of African American history in our state. So this comes, if you're a member, you'll get this in the mail probably um, later this week, I hope. And if you're not, you can uh, take a membership. Uh, we invite you to do that. It's the best way to get involved in Nebraska history is to be a member of Nebraska State Historical Society, where you receive our journal and a lot of other benefits. So our brochures are in the back, and our folks in the store would be happy to help you with that. We will also be opening our exhibit on this subject matter, which will be opening on uh, January 5, 2011, out here, in, right here in this institution. And uh, while I'm advertising, I will also mention um, our exhibit on the third floor. I don't know if you'll have time to see that tonight, but please come back uh, on Willa Cather, one of our best known Nebraskans, and a very, very interesting personality. And by using her clothing and accoutrements, the things she, she collected, wore, and lived with throughout her life from our collection and from the collection of the um, Willa Cather Memorial Foundation in Red Cloud, I think we're able to get an even a different view of Willa Cather that also helps us to uh, understand her and the strong personality and wonderful writer that she was. But tonight we're here for a very special lecture by Dr. James Riding in, who is Associate Professor of American Indian Studies at Arizona State University. Dr. Riding in is a member of the Pawnee Tribe. He attended the Haskell Indian School in Kansas, then Fort Lewis uh, College or University in uh, Colorado, and then went to UCLA in Los Angeles for his master's degree and his doctorate. He's been associated with Arizona State for many, many years, first in the, in the uh, College of Social Justice and now as director of the, of the uh, associate professor and director of the American Indian Studies program. He is also editor of the um, Wichasa Review, published by the University of Minnesota Press, and chair of the board of trustees of the Pawnee Nation, Co of the Pawnee Nation College. He is well um, known in American Indian and American Indian uh, scholarship circles. He has written extensively on a wide variety of subjects, and tonight he's going to share with us his thoughts on the Pawnee and American colonialism. Dr. Riding in. James. Good evening. How's everyone this evening? I'm honored that you came out to hear me speak tonight. It's always a, a pleasure to come back to Nebraska. And, uh, you know, when we say we, the people of Nebraska, one time, you know, us Pawnees could say that we were one of the first peoples of Nebraska. And I'm going to talk about some of the hard truths about why we are no longer in Nebraska uh, tonight. And uh, that's why I entitled my presentation. Uh, if I can figure out uh, this technology, uh, about uh, Pawnee Indians and U.S. colonialism, civil liberty matters on the 19th century Central Plains. One of the uh, problems I had uh, when uh, John uh, Carter, my good friend John, asked me to be a part of this um, speaker series was to figure out how am I going to fit civil liberty matters into what I do because you know, the uh, uh, Constitution did not apply to Indians, and civil liberties didn't. But what I decided, the, the context I'm using, is that uh, civil liberties were a political value of American society, 
but these civil liberties were often not extended to Pawnee people or other Indians. And um, so that's, that's the fit. So I, as I mentioned before, uh, I'm going to talk about some hard truths tonight. And oftentimes white America has a hard time dealing with the hard truths about American Indian experiences under the United States as uh, domination. Uh, let me begin by saying that, uh, that there is a sanitized version of history that proclaims that Pawnees never waged war against the United States government and that the famous Pawnee scouts were brave, faithful, and obedient followers, followers of their white commanders. This story suggests erroneously that Pawnees enjoyed a cozy and friendly relationship with white Americans, the United States government, and the U.S. Army. This yarn also belies the harmful consequences that U.S. expansionism inflicted on Pawnees both before and after the formation of the first Pawnee Scout enlistment in 1864. It ignores the fact that U.S. policymakers and agents had li literally subjected Pawnees along with other Indians under what Lumbee legal scholar Robert Williams terms in his seminal study about the U.S. Supreme Court and Indians a white racial dictatorship. So uh, this is uh, the premise of my presentation. I'm going to talk about a little bit about this in the context of colonialism. So the rise of this colonial dictatorship over Indians is not such a far-fetched notion if we keep in mind that the U.S. Constitution legitimated slavery during the antebellum years, and this was a brutal institution that stripped uh, the enslaved of their civil rights and human dignity, and a flagrant contradiction of U.S. political values. With its roots stemming back to the colonial experiences in, uh, of uh, Great Britain and North America, this dictatorship rests on four interrelated principles or factors. The first is that an expansionistic vision held by this new settler nation that its citizens had a manifest destiny to spread its civilization across a continent into lands belonging to others. The second is a belief among white Americans that they occupied a lofty status of intellectual and cultural superior, superiority over non-Indians excuse me, over non-whites, including Indians. A third is a long-established litany of racial stereotypes that cast Indians as inferior and vicious savages who use land wastefully. A final is the willingness of white America to expropriate lands through the exertion of power, diplomacy, corruption, and violence. Racist laws, policies, and U.S. Supreme Court decisions formed the legal foundation of this racial dictatorship and it also, these uh, um, factors also sanctioned colonialism. As the, non, as the uh, settler nation pushed its borders westward, those Indians who stood in the way saw unprecedented and mostly unwelcome change come into their lives. These, di these disruptions, including the loss of their life, freedom, land, and life-sustaining resources brought tremendous devastation to Indian peoples. Put in the context of U.S. political rhetoric, the effects of colonialism literally deprived Indians of their life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, while exempting them from civil liberties emanating from the U.S. Bill of Rights and U.S. Constitution. And I see this exemption as being actually a good thing because Indians are not a part of the Constitution. Indians and their governments predate the form of the Constitution for thousands of years. And if the United States government would have tried to include Indians within the Constitution, then it would have been another act of colonialism. The way that Indians did become included or subjected under the Constitution was by Supreme Court decisions, treaties, and acts of Congress. So uh, rather than curbing uh, 
acting to curb uh, these acts of subjugation, domination, and genocide, the U.S. government urged forward by its citizens' impulses proceeded as if the imperialistic behavior conformed with acceptable, if not contradic contradictory, standards of morality and decency held so dear by the masses of the embryo embryonic democracy for themselves. Indians of the 19th century, uh, white American, uh, Indians in the 19th century white American mindset stood beyond the scope of humanity, unworthy of respect and dignity. Uh, I should also note that, uh, that uh, it's my belief that uh, white Americans should have extended the civil liberties to Indians, you know, the right to a fair trial, the right, the right to religious freedom, uh, so forth and so on, uh, because they did this to visitors to this country. Visitors to this country had a right to bear arms, had a right to visit, uh, to, to worship freely, they had a right to a fair trial. Uh, but for Indians, uh, this was not uh, the case. When the uh, U.S. government came into existence in the late 1780s, its officials recognized the sovereignty of Indian nations and dealt with them on a government-to-government -government relationship. And that's pr primarily because Indians had power, and the United States government uh, uh, had just fought a bloody revolutionary war. It was uh, uh, indebted. And it um, actually saw Indian land as a way to uh, come out of, the, um, out of its uh, uh, debt. Because Indians owned and occupied the North American interior, lands covered by white Americans, the United States treated Indians as put actual and potential enemies, however. White Americans during this century generally embraced the twin notions of white superiority and Indian inferiority. And their racial consciousness served as a perceptual filter that shaped the conceptualization and implementation of a national policy of territorial aggrandizement that had harmful consequences on Indians. Uh, I got carried away and I had a few slides that I wanted to show you along the way about, uh, about Pawnee Scouts and, you know, <laughs> people who risk their lives, not only for the United States, but also for the Pawnee people, because this was a, a military alliance that the Pawnees entered into uh, in, the, in the 1860s. But this military alliance did not work out for the Pawnee people when we were removed from Nebraska. And I'll talk more about that as the, um, um, as the lecture proceeds. Early in the, uh, this country's history, the United States' history, um, the federal government adopted this policy expressed in the Northwest Ordinance of uh, 1787 that said that the utmost good faith shall always be observed toward Indians, their lands, property, and shall never be taken from them without their consent, and in their property, rights, and liberty. They shall never be invaded or disturbed, but the laws, but laws founded in justice and humanity shall from time to time be made for wrongs done to them and for preserving peace and friendship with them. Would well, have been good if this philosophy would have been carried out uh, by the uh, government, uh, but it wasn't. Uh, this is a scene of uh, Pawnee life. This is a uh, uh, Pawnee territory. Uh, I think it's much more extensive than uh, on this map. The Kansas were actually sort of newcomers into Pawnee lands as were the other groups who had migrated down the uh, 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 Ohio River into the, the Great Plains. Uh, so they uh, began to encroach upon uh, uh, Pawnee lands, and Pawnees made accommodations for them, uh, more or less. Uh, the uh, uh, Pawnees were not willing to accept the newcomers into their lands, the white Americans. And in 1822, a, uh, a Pawnee leader by the name of Sarisa just visited Washington, D.C. with other um, uh, Indians. And the purpose of this trip was to show Indian leaders of the Central Plains the power of the United States government in hopes that Indians would stop the encroachments of non-Indians on their lands. So uh, 
This is a fairly long speech that, uh, that uh, this uh, leader gave. And uh, he compared, you know, the uh, white Americans with Pawnees and found a lot of commonalities between the two. But uh, in the context of what I'm talking about is the third bullet point here. And it's that uh, he told uh, the President of the United States, um, the Secretary of, uh, of uh, War and others there that uh, we have plenty of buffalo, beaver and deer and other wild animals. We have an abundance of horses. We have everything we want. We have plenty of land if you keep your people off of it. And as we know, you know, that wasn't the case. Um, Pawnees had had a, a long history before this of protecting their land and resources from uh, uh, encroachments. Uh, beginning in the, uh, during the late 1860s and early 1870s, Pawnees allowed Frenchmen into their towns for the purpose of trade. But uh, the Pawnee relationship with the Spanish was uh, different because the Pawnees knew what was going on in New Mexico with the Pueblos. The Pueblos had been politically subjugated by Spain. And uh, um, the Pawnees wanted to maintain their freedom. They wanted to maintain their way of life. So in the 1870, uh, excuse me, 1720, when a um, Spanish expedition was sent to uh, the Central Plains to try to investigate reports that the, uh, the, that the French were trying to establish a, a presence there. Um, the Pawnees, aided by some Otos, struck a primitive blow against the spread of Spanish colonialism. So, you know, throughout the, uh, American, uh, throughout the Americas, Spain had used brutal force, plunder, uh, to, um, to uh, subjugate Indian nations and to enslave uh, those people uh, who fell under their power. So the Pawnees, as I mentioned, were well aware of the Spanish and what they had done uh, in New Mexico. So that uh, uh, expedition was led by a, uh, a, 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 a Spanish commander from Santa Fe by the name of Villasur. So following that defeat, Spain never attempted to control the Pawnee Confederacy and use uh, uh, through, through the use of military might. I should say uh, that um, when the United States came into contact with the uh, uh, Pawnees, what uh, pursued, or ensued, excuse me, um, was what Michael Mann calls murderous ethnic cleansing. And that means that the uh, rapidly approaching white Americans wanted Pawnee land and that they were willing to take it by whatever means possible. And before they got to the plains, this ethnic cleansing had been taking place east of the Mississippi River. So colonialism was about the taking the land and resources belonging to others and the subjugation of the indigenous landowners by fiat, coerce, and coercion, and violence. And that's what the uh, uh, Spanish colonizers brought over. That's what the English colonizers brought over. That's what others brought over. So the, uh, the U.S. Constitution preamble, which begins with the words, we the people of the United States, uh, quite correctly, the we did not apply to untaxed Indians because of their status as members of independent nations. In American Indians, American Justice, Vine Deloria and his co-author Clifford Lytle state that U.S. policymakers considered Indians as members of small nations who would never become citizens, and I'm quoting here, who would remain forever outside the political institutions of the United States. Deloria and Lytle reasoned that the Constitution was framed during the late 18, uh, 1780s, um, and white Americans lacked a concern over the political status because political status of Indians to the West because of the, because the interior of the continent, I'm quoting again, could not be inhabited by civilized people and that there would always be a wilderness populated by tribes of Indians some distance from the centers of civilization. So the, uh, those 55 um, 
uh, white elitist males who came together in 1787 to form a strong central government recognized the inherent sovereignty of Indians and their independent status. Uh, they simply uh, placed authority of Congress to regulate of Congress to regulate commerce with four nations among the several states and with Indian tribes. The administrative branch was given the power to enter into treaties with uh, four nations, including Indian nations, with the consent of Congress. And the fear of U.S. citizens about the uh, abuse of um, federal power led to the inclusion of those constitutional amendments designed to guarantee personal liberties, the right of religious freedom to bear arms to a fair trial, to live free of government persecution, uh, to live free of, uh, uh, and, and so there'd be freedom from cruel and unusual, unusual punishment and other civil liberties enumerated in the Bill of Rights. But uh, what uh, happened was that a series of um, Supreme Court decisions uh, did, in fact, affirm the extra-constitutional status of Indians. As I mentioned, U.S. society used racist language and its power to elevate white Americans to a position of superiority over Indians, political superiority, and also to denigrate them as inferior, you know, through uh, uh, expressions of popular culture, through expressions of, of political rhetoric, and so forth and so on. In, um, in uh, 1783, George Washington, the first U.S. president, used the Indian as a wolf metaphor to encourage Congress to implement a policy of ethnic cleansing against Indians of the Ohio Valley and beyond. This is a, a part of his uh, talk. Uh, a, um, a few years later, in um, 1807, President Thomas Jefferson used virtually the same language of the Indian as bestial war-loving savages, writing, if ever we are constrained to lift a hatchet against any tribe, we will never lay it down till the tribe is exterminated or driven beyond the Mississippi. In war, they will kill some of us. We shall destroy all of them. So that's an expression of genocide and the United States government's willingness to to use extermination to accomplish its goals of uh, obtaining Indian land if Indians resisted. And a few years before that, uh, um, Jefferson had purchased France's Doctrine of Discovery claim um, to Pawnee land and another uh, and, and, uh, and much more land. So the Doctrine of Discovery is one of those fictive creations of Europeans to say that they have ownership rights over uh, Indians. The uh, uh, over Indian lands, excuse me. Um, so not long after the uh, Louisiana Purchase, um, uh, Jefferson deployed an armed expedition to gather demographic information about Indian nations, to collect scientific information, and to inform Indians encountered along the way that they now lived under the political authority of the United States. And the first uh, uh, U.S. delegation to visit the Pawnees or at least one Pawnee town along the present-day Kansas-Nebraska border happened in 1806 when uh, Zebulon Pike and his small force arrived there. And it was a very contentious meeting. And, uh, and, uh, and during that meeting, uh, uh, Pike uh, told his host that, uh, that they were now under the political supremacy of the United States. So during the succeeding years, the U.S. Supreme Court handed down a series of decisions based on discourses of racist notions and colonial privilege that undermined Indian sovereignty, legitimized land losses, sanctioned religious oppression, and legitimized other human rights violations. In an 1823 decision, the McIntosh v. Uh, Johnson decision, uh, 
uh, John Marshall, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, said that with discovery, the title to the land passed from the discovering European nation, uh, excuse me, it passed from the Indians to the discovering European nation, and that Indians only had the right of occupancy to those lands, and that right of occupancy could be uh, terminated by either purchase or by conquest. The Supreme Court went on to further define the legal status of Indians in ways that subjected them under the, the political supremacy of the United States. In 1831, the Supreme Court held that Indians were not four nations, but domestic dependent nations living in a state of tutelage or pupillage. And John Marshall characterized the relationship of the U.S. government uh, with Indians as one re resembling a guardian with his ward. The following year, uh, uh, in 1832, um, the Supreme Court um, uh, stated again that uh, Indian nations uh, were under the political supremacy of the United States government, but that state laws did not apply to them on Indian lands. So this is a part of the um, political uh, intellectual environment that was uh, accompanying uh, um, the U.S. expansion as the embryonic nation pushed westward into the interior. And in doing so, um, these movements sparked uh, conflicts and removal treaties. A lot of blood was spilled along the way. Uh, increasingly, um, white Americans demanded that uh, Indians forfeit their customary ways of living, adopt Christianity, and live in accordance with white American values, beliefs, and worldview. But uh, the, the vanguard of this uh, um, invasion, you know, wasn't really concerned about uh, those issues. Uh, it was more concerned about trying to see that Indians were um, placated and would not resist the U.S. expansion. Uh, the first treaty that the Pawnees entered into with the United States was in 1818, and uh, it was just a, 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 a treaty of uh, peace and friendship. And in that treaty, the um, United States said it would serve as a protector of the Pawnees, whatever that means. It means that uh, they would uh, pretty much do whatever they wanted with the Pawnees once they gained the power to do so. So that's the... Uh, you know, again, the, the context of, um, of uh, the Pawnee Chief's um, talk, you know, the Pawnee's determination to resist expansion, to preserve their own ways, and to uh, 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 live in accordance with the way of life given to them by Titawahat, uh, or the Pawnee Creator. Uh, there are many incidences that I could speak about, or episodes, but uh, I want to kind of focus on the trails that went through uh, Pawnee land, and then I'm going to talk about the uh, uh, reservation period and then the incorporation of uh, Pawnees under the U.S. Ju uh, judicial system. Okay, the roads or trails, uh, as they are called, um, carved through Pawnee lands, intensified the conflict and led to a process whereby the U.S. military came to the scene not as impartial dispensers of justice, but as protectors of white Americans. And there were two major trails that went through Pawnee lands. The first was the um, Santa Fe Trail. I just finished an extensive study for the Park Service uh, on the Santa Fe Trail. The Santa Fe Trail uh, um, ran from Missouri to Santa Fe, initially an international road uh, that uh, Missouri traders opened up so they could uh, 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 carry on commerce with New Mexico. Uh, the, his the historiography of the Santa Fe Trail is, is, uh, is uh, very lacking, and it just presents the trail as, um, as a, uh, a, a grand chapter in American nation building. And it really doesn't discuss the negative consequences of the trail on indigenous peoples. And that's what the uh, National Park Service wanted me to do, was to look at uh, that relationship and to, to provide an Indian perspective of it. Uh, there's a book that just came out called uh, uh, White Shell Place 
uh, if I recall, by the water, White Shell Place, White Shell Place Water, uh, and it's, uh, it's Indian voices um, concerning the 400-year uh, uh, commemoration of Santa Fe. And uh, I did a, a chapter in that called uh, Colonial Indians, Indians and the Santa Fe Trail of Tears and Conquest with a, the subtitle Challenging the Master Narrative. So I think that that study is going to shake up the good old boys who have written all these uh, really lopsided histories about uh, uh, um, the trail. But uh, what uh, was very problematic uh, uh, from a Pawnee context was that, uh, was that the, the white Americans uh, who established these trails and no other government ever tried to establish permission or gain permission from the Pawnees to cross through their lands along the uh, Arkansas River. So it was an act of encroachment. And it was much more uh, uh, troubling that because uh, these intruders traveling back and forth between uh, Santa Fe and Missouri and vice uh, versa disrupted Pawnee life by killing game, particularly the buffalo, on which the Pawnees relied for food, clothing, and implementation. It was also a very important part of uh, the Pawnee um, uh, religion spirituality. So the U.S. officials refused to keep out trespassers or try to police their criminal behavior. Pawnees sought to preserve their quality of life by taking punitive measures against the interlopers, occasionally taking life and property. Consequently, the Pawnees developed a reputation as being powerful, predatory savages. And um, that uh, um, image became further solidified with uh, each passing year, up until about the 1850s when the Pawnees were pretty much devastated by disease and other factors. Um, but um, what the uh, um, Pawnee actions did, along with those other Indians who resisted the Santa Fe Trail, was to lead, for, uh, lead to uh, harsh calls for punishment, if not their extermination. The United States government did enter into a, a right-of-way treaties with the Ka and the Osage uh, nations in 1825, but again, they did, did not do so um, with the Pawnees. Uh, the, uh, the, to get back to the imagery of, uh, of um, Pawnees held by white Americans, uh, it led to uh, what Pawnees considered an act of genocide committed by Santa Fe uh, traders. In 1831, a smallpox epidemic swept through the Pawnee towns, killing about half of the Pawnee population, about 10,000 or so people. And it was the Pawnee's assertion that Santa Fe traders had intentionally given some of their people gifts infected with the, with the deadly smallpox virus. Uh, but did the government take any action to investigate this? No. So, uh, uh, you know, this was pretty common when, when white Americans committed acts against Indians, the federal government really didn't investigate them, or if they did, um, nothing was really done. Uh, 1864, I'm going to jump a little bit ahead in time, um, was a time when Comanches, Kiowas, and others were beginning to disrupt uh, the Santa Fe Trail traffic uh, uh, on a more regular basis. And this was a time when the United States government moved from sending roving patrols to the area to begin to establish its first permanent forts. Uh, uh, and that one was a um, Fort Man. Actually, it was a temporary fort that, uh, that was set up uh, in the uh, mid-1840s uh, along the Arkansas River. A, a group of passing Pawnees were lured into the fort uh, with the soldiers pretending like they wanted peace. About uh, 60 Pawnees uh, uh, responded by entering the fort unarmed. And uh, once they got inside the fort, these Pawnees became alarmed by the sight of these soldiers preparing for battle. Most of the Pawnees escaped, making it through the gate and to the um, river. But a few of them fell mortally wounded, and about 20 others were uh, wounded uh, by the soldiers. 
despite the soldiers' guilt for organizing and carrying out this massacre or attempted massacre, U.S. officials only expelled the bungling commanding officer from Indian country. Nothing was done to them for this act. In 1840, early 1840s, the uh, Oregon Mormon Trail opened up that ran more directly through Pawnee land uh, along the Platte River and it, it came up uh, from Missouri up to uh, the big the Blue River and up to the Platte River. So uh, this trail was uh, uh, more disruptive than the Santa Fe Trail uh, on the Pawnees because of its proximity to the Pawnee towns. And again, U.S. officials did not attempt to gain Pawnee permission for this trail. I should have mentioned that in 1833, the Pawnees entered into uh, its first, uh, their first land session treaty with the federal government. And uh, according to the Pawnee view of this treaty, they were only ceding a small section of land for the Delawares, who are one of these groups that were being removed from east of the Mississippi River to the west of the Mississippi River as a part of the U.S. government's policy of ethnic cleansing. Um, but the written version of the treaty said that the Pawnees had ceded all their lands south of the Platte River. So, you know, the Pawnees, uh, 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 in my interpretation, never did give up their claim to that uh, land until a little later in time. So the, uh, uh, Santa, uh, the uh, Oregon Trail, the Mormon Trail, uh, created conflict. In 1848, the Pawnees ceded another strip of land on the Platte River at Grand Island, where soldiers established Fort Kearney, which was about one day's march from the, uh, the Pawnee towns. And the proximity of that fort to the Pawnees became a very disruptive factor, a threat. Soldiers there occasionally dis dis uh, distributed food to starving Pawnees, but they also fought and terrorized Pawnees. In a uh, occurrence that happened in the spring of 1847, Chawis, there's four Pawnee uh, uh, bands that I didn't mention. The Pawnees are actually a confederacy of four uh, uh, confederated nations or tribes or bands, whatever you want to call them. The uh, uh, Chawi, Kikahaki, Pitahawidat, and Skidi. And uh, the, there was the, the Chawis, uh, a faction of them, uh, led by another individual by the name of Sadi Sadis, um, uh, was the ones that uh, took the most aggressive action against the uh, uh, Santa Fe Trail and also the, uh, uh, the Oregon Trail. Uh, in the spring of 1847, uh, some men from his town killed a large number of oxen belonging to an immigrant train. And uh, after investigating the charges, U.S. agent um, Alexander McElroy told, uh, reported that Chawis were planning to rob and kill more whites. And a short time later, Pawnee stole about 80 mules from a U.S. government uh, train near Fort Kearney. Uh, this U.S. agent, backed by U.S. soldiers went to Sadi Sadis's town to recover the missing property, and uh, the Chawis uh, resisted. So this uh, agent wrote uh, that the uh, old chief would not give up the animals unless compelled to do so by army coercion. So the uh, United States Army probably did recover most of these animals, uh, but in doing so, you know, they decided to uh, try to exert more dominance over. Pawnee life, Pawnee activities. In late 1848, two uh, army officers visited uh, a Chawi town, and the chief there made a throat-cutting gesture while mentioning Sadisa Sadisa's name. And uh, what the Pawnees called the Sioux were throat cutters, and this was a symbol for it. So what uh, this chief was probably trying to tell these two soldiers, these army officers, was that uh, that Sadi Sadis was probably out fighting the Sioux. Uh, but uh, these army officers interpreted the chief's motions as saying that the Chow that the defiant Chawi chief was planning a war against whites. 
So the following morning, 250 um, soldiers from Fort Kearney surrounded the Pawnee town, and they had two 12-pound artillery pieces with them. The way that the uh, fight was diverted was that the Pawnee men headed for the hills. They scattered so uh, that a indiscriminate firing into the town would not lead to the loss of innocent lives you know, of women and children. So after the, the meeting, the, uh, the, the, the military met with uh, the Pawnees, and a uh, daily Missouri Republican uh, entry reported that we uh, tried to describe uh, what happened, and he, and he said, we brought off O Saris Arias as a prisoner, meaning that the army took him prisoner, not for what he had done lately, for of late years. I believe he has been killing Sioux and Buffalo, but for the misdeeds of his past life. So, you know, they took him to uh, 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 Fort Kearney and detained him for several months without ever filing charges against him. This same uh, chief had recently had his wife killed by a passing wagon train without the U.S. Army taking any action to find a killer or to punish a killer. The uh, arrest and the, uh, of Sadi Sadis and the um, threat of attack on the, on the Pawnee town, however, did not awe all some uh, Pawnees into submission. The Pawnees continued to fight skirmishes against the United States Army for the next few years. One, uh, one of the soldiers uh, stationed at Fort Kearney considered the Pawnees the most dangerous Indians along the uh, uh, Oregon Trail at that time. So, uh, you know, there were a number of casualties that uh, were inflicted on both sides uh, in some of the fighting. Uh, in uh, 1854, Congress enacted the Kansas-Nebraska Act, and uh, the territory of Nebraska was established, and that signaled the arrival of settlers in Pawnee Country. Uh, most of the Indian nations within Nebraska that in 1854 ceded their lands to the United States, but uh, the uh, United States government did not try to get another treaty with the Pawnees until 1857. Uh, but meanwhile, uh, the settlers uh, began to um, create problems for Pawnees. They began to steal timber, went onto Pawnee land to steal uh, timber. Uh, and the Pawnees would resist it, you know. So they, they lasted, these settlers lacked respect for Pawnee property rights. They encroached on lands, and they slaughtered game. Uh, when uh, Pawnee officials denied, excuse me, when, when white American officials denied uh, Pawnee requests for compensation and relief, young Pawnees took matters into their own hands by taking property from the offenders. They went to Fremont and gave the uh, uh, settlers there three days to evacuate the town or face attack, but um, uh, there was no attack that occurred. So, you know, territory officials uh, refused to police the actions of uh, their citizens. And the only recourse that Pawnees had was their own power to stop the abuses being committed against them. But to do so could lead to a, another confrontation with the military that could be disruptive to Pawnee life. So in uh, 1857, the Pawnees uh, did cede um, the rest of their lands. You know, the Pawnees at this time were in uh, dire economic straits. And they retained a, a small piece of land, 15 uh, by 30 mile section of land north of the Platte River. Uh, uh, right there on the on the Loup River, or Loup, they caught the Loup Fork in, in in those years, in return for a small annuity fund in perpetuity. That's the Pawnee word for uh, for buffalo, and uh, you know the slaughter of the buffalo, which intensified as time went by. This is the Pawnee Reservation. Uh, this little section of land. So if you saw the map, probably go over this section of land. This is all that was left uh, 
after that treaty. And anyways, uh, uh, the, the Pawnees uh, accepted a small annuity fund, um, promises of U.S. government assistance, schools, uh, an assimilation program, which the Pawnees had no, no uh, intent to assimilate, and they never did consent to the destruction of their way of life. Uh, Article 8 of this treaty stated that Pawnees agreed to del deliver up to the officers of the United States all offenders against the treaties and laws and regulations of the United States wherever they may be found within their limits, within the limits of their reservation. And they further agree to assist such officers in discovering, pursuing, and capturing such offender or offenders anywhere whenever called upon to do so. And uh, the United States government said it could withhold uh, uh, annuities if the Pawnees failed to comply with this term. And it's interesting, this, turning, this treaty didn't say anything about punishing, you know, the, United, the Pawnees having the ability to, to exert similar types of actions over non-Indians. Anyways, um, um, when the Pawnees did not move to the reservation uh, as soon as it was expected by this treaty, um, uh, in 18... Uh, conflict uh, erupted. In 1859, the summer of 1859, the Pawnees crossed, crossed the uh, Platte River and uh, uh, were going on their hunt. And as they were moving away from their towns, they saw, they saw smoke coming up. And some of their men went back to investigate and they found that, uh, that uh, those left behind, the infirm, the, some of the women, children, and the elderly had been slaughtered. The local settlers blamed the Sioux for this, but the Pawnees have been, who had been fighting the Sioux for, since the 1820s, um, knew very well, you know, the difference between a Sioux attack and a Pawnee attack. So they blamed the local settlers uh, for this, and they began to um, uh, uh, attack the property of white settlers up the Elkhorn Valley, and this led to the sending of troops and uh, from Fort Kearney and uh, uh, territorial militia against the Pawnees. And um, uh, the uh, action of, um, of the head uh, Pawnee chief, uh, oh, I'm a little ahead of myself here. Um, uh, his name is uh, uh, Peter de Sado, um, or man chief as it's interpreted into, um, got an American flag and rode out and stopped the uh, um, the soldiers and militia from attacking. And in negotiations, the Pawnees agreed to turn over um, some of the uh, men who had been involved in, in the uh, uh, destruction of the property and the looting of some of those uh, uh, so, uh, homesteads of those settlers. So, uh, you know, the fate of those individuals is uncertain. Um, one uh, account said that uh, some of them were killed while trying to escape by the militiamen. And others said that so others um, um, got away. But so, you know, we're not, I haven't found any evidence what happened to them. Uh, so, um, again, you know, this shows the disparity of justice uh, that existed. So after that, the Pawnees did uh, move to that small reservation. And uh, on that reservation, the uh, that uh, the, the news of the white racial dictatorship became tightened. And a double standard of justice became more even por uh, more pronounced and troubling to the Pawnees, especially in cases of interracial homicide. In 1859, settlers stole Pawnee horses and killed two Pawnee men who went looking for those animals. Six years later, U.S. soldiers killed three Pawnees simply because they failed to identify themselves. In 1865, on the road to Columbus, a settler took out his brand new pistol and shot an elderly Pawnee just to test the firing power of his pistol. And it was a good weapon. That uh, elderly gentleman died. So these uh, uh, incidents uh, did nothing to cause local authorities to press charges against the culprits. The Pawnees were really upset uh, with the killing of the old man, and they wanted compensation, or they wanted justice. When What the United States government did was to uh, 
um, uh, recommend that a uh, hundred dollars be given to the uh, the Pawnees. Then in 1869, uh, a group of Pawnees who had been recently discharged from the United States Army were killed at Mulberry Creek in Kansas, and uh, a number of them were later decapitated, and their um, crania were sent to the uh, Army Medical Museum where the uh, uh, U.S. Army was conducting craniometric studies to try to prove the superiority of the white race. But anyways, um, about this time, uh, a settler uh, was killed near, on an island near uh, Columbus, and blame fell on Pawnees who had been camped there. So, uh, you know, when uh, um, these deaths of Pawnees occurred, you know, you, uh, not a whimper was raised amongst uh, white officials. But the murder of this one uh, white settler um, created uh, widespread outrage towards Pawnees. Some people were demanding the extermination of the Pawnees, and um, they wanted uh, justice to be had. So the, uh, uh, at this time, this is about the time that the Quakers took control of the Pawnee Agency. Um, is after that. So, you know, the Quakers, one of their I ideas was to assimilate Pawnees into white society. An important step in that process of assimilation was to have the, the Pawnees subjected to white American laws. So, uh, what happened, what was the result uh, in what uh, is called the Yellow Sun Affair, or the Yellow Sun case, was a travesty of justice. White settlers went onto the reservation, demanded that the killers be turned over. The Pawnees refused to do so. They actually held counsel, tried to find out if they their people response, but didn't, didn't find out anything. And then, uh, then this is when the, the uh, U.S. government took over. And uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, agents, these Quakers, uh, evoked the terms of the 1857 uh, treaty that said that if the Pawnees did, uh, did not uh, hope to uh, uh, find parties who had committed crimes against, um, against uh, um, white people, that uh, their rations could be cut off. Uh, these are, four, these are um, some of the individuals that were ultimately in this, uh, in this case and tried uh, for uh, Mac, uh, McMurty's uh, mur uh, death, and that's, that's the name of that settler. Uh, who was killed. So, uh, you know, the annuities at this time had become very important to the Pawnee economy. It was $30,000 in perpetuity that uh, the Pawnees would get uh, in goods and in cash. So these were economic uh, uh, hardship. This was times of economic hardship for the Pawnees. So they could use their annuity goods, they could use their cash to provide provisions. And um, when the Pawnees... Uh, um, uh, the uh, Quaker agents stopped the, uh, uh, the, the annuities from coming to the Pawnees. The Pawnees reluctantly turned over a number of men who were taken to Omaha. And there was still no evidence against these individuals who were turned over to authorities. So uh, uh, what the, uh, um, the uh, U.S. prosecutors did was to hatch another uh, scheme in, in conjunction with those Mormons that they would, uh, excuse me, Quakers, getting my religious groups mixed up here, uh, that they would uh, stop the upcoming Pawnee hunt until the Pawnees turned, uh, gained evidence against those individuals. So the, uh, um, the Pawnee chiefs went to Omaha and met in council with uh, uh, those eight individuals to try to um, find out uh, if they knew anything about what had happened to that settler, uh, how he had been killed or why he had been killed or even if they were responsible. And uh, they found no evidence. Uh, the, but nevertheless, a U.S. grand jury indicted um, three individuals, Horse Driver, Little Wolf, and uh, the individual that I showed in the picture, this elderly Pawnee gentleman by the name of uh, uh, Yellow Sun. And later, um, a, gr a grand jury indicted a fourth individual by the name of Blue Hawk, who went to the Pawnee Reservation and arrested the first Blue Hawk that he came across. And uh, there were several Blue Hawks 
within the Pawnee uh, reservation. And those people who knew the Pawnees knew this and questioned whether the right Blue Hawk had been arrested. Anyways, uh, these uh, uh, four uh, Pawnees were put on trial with uh, uh, U.S. Federal Judge uh, Elmer Dundee presiding. And uh, the uh, um, prosecution still lacked evidence. There was no credible witnesses to, the, to this event. There was no uh, uh, self-incrimination by any of the evidence. Um, so the, uh, um, the uh, um, prosecution, however, had the race card on its side, the racial attitudes of, of uh, <coughs> Nebraskans towards Indians. You know, in that environment, could a panel of 12 jurists be selected who lacked racial biases for a crime in which Indians were accused of killing a white settler? The answer was no. Uh, the, uh, uh, the Omaha Herald um, actually did a good job of reporting about this incident and said in the end that these four individuals were convicted on evidence that would not convict Negroes in Omaha for stealing chickens. Anyways, uh, uh, these individuals um, suffered while they were in jail, and I think that's why that picture of uh, Yellow Sun uh, we saw earlier with him looking so skinny is a reflection on uh, the harsh confinement that they were under. So, uh, these individuals were convicted and before uh, of capital murder, and uh, what we see is, uh, is uh, uh, the Quakers beginning to advocate the death penalty. They wanted to approach uh, U.S. officials, the judge, and have him condemn these individuals to death. Quakers, pacifists, people who don't believe in the capital punishment, uh, uh, the sense of capital punishment, advocating a death penalty. Well, the reason why they wanted to go to U.S. Grant, the president, and have him to commute the sentences of most of those individuals except for, for, um, for uh, Yellow Sun so that they could be freed or um, serve less time. But anyways, before anything was done, uh, Dundee decided that the issue of jurisdictions be, should be determined because this incident had happened off reservation. And uh, the, uh, it was determined that uh, the state that had jurisdiction rather than the federal government and uh, uh, the uh, uh, the state tried to uh, tried to uh, uh, hold trial several times, but uh, no, they they couldn't get anyone to come to uh, Lincoln. A change of venue was granted to uh, testify on their behalf. So those individuals were re released in 1871 on a writ of habeas corpus, and most of them, probably three of them, died as a result of their harsh confinement. Okay. So meanwhile. Um, Armed white settlers uh, uh, began to come on the Pawnee Reservation and steal timber. And uh, there was no relief for the Pawnees. Actually, the white, uh, the, uh, the white racial dictatorship noose even tightened. The federal government tried to stop Pawnee patrols from keeping these uh, settlers off of Pawnee land. So it was a, a situation where um, Pawnees had no justice. They could get no justice under the uh, white uh, uh, system of uh, jurisdiction. And a number of Pawnees began to decide to move to Oklahoma to try to escape this uh, white racial dictatorship. And one individual, uh, he's identified in the records as uh, Estadostes. I'm, I'm not sure what even language that's in, but. Uh, it could be Big Spotted Horse, who was a Pawnee, uh, who was one of those who led the first uh, group of Pawnees to remove to Oklahoma. And what he said is really important to the, uh, this uh, national uh, um, council that met in Tahlequah. Um, he said, we can scarcely move without disturbing some white person. If a Pawnee lays his hand on a stick of timber or grass, a white man says, hold, this is mine. If a Pawnee horse gets beyond the limits of the narrow reserve, he need not hunt him. We are surrounded up there on all sides by the white man, and I and my people will come here 
and surrender our part to him. So a couple years later, all Pawnees were removed to Oklahoma. And uh, so the ethnic cleansing of Pawnees uh, from Nebraska uh, has been kind of completed. But we're back. We come back to, <laughs> to, uh, uh, to rebury our dead that were stolen in the name of science. Uh, we come back to give lectures, to, to teach about uh, the history of our people, to talk about these hard, cold, cruel facts of the relationship that existed, and um, uh, to show you that, uh, that uh, you know, that there are solutions to our problems. You know, we've formed the Pawnee Nation College uh, in Oklahoma, um, educating uh, our young people and others, non-Indians. We're trying to indigenize education for all by providing uh, a good education. Uh, we've been in operation about four years. And uh, I don't know myself in a, in a picture that says wisdom. I guess I was <laughs> kind of uh, stretching things. But uh, this is our board of trustees, and this is with Black Al, uh, Julia Goodfox, who are also on the board of trustees. And, and this is our future, our graduates. And we have survived. Okay, um, out of time.